Um, yeah, and as you said, I've been doing a lot on spatial data and I've been running the location and the web workshop before. So there also was always a lot of interaction because none of them work alone. You can't do only spatial, you can't do only temporal. Things happen somewhere and some when. So yeah, and I'm working at NTNU that is in Trondheim in Norway. Uh, on a lot of smart city projects that we are running there inside the university with different departments and with a lot of outside European partners. And in most of the projects strongly also with cities and then with their local ecosystem, with industry, with SMEs. Um, so I'm more like bridging the different domains. It's a very interdisciplinary work. So unfortunately, I don't have any math or maybe lucky for you on these slides. Um, and I'm going to show a few examples of what what is already happening or what might be happening because that also, uh, when Mark invited me here, triggered a bit more thinking of what we already do that we should frame better in this way or what options are there where things are not quite working yet as well as they should. So yeah, uh, this one's mm -hmm. not? Do, oh, ah, yeah. useful. <laughs> then I'll go. Oh, yeah. the, the sticky thing. Yeah. There it works. Yeah, good, thank you. <laughs> this is Torn Time. Uh, this is up in Norway. This is in autumn, so it looks a bit different now. You see it's a smaller scale city, um, lots of mountains around. You can s see some snow in the back on the mountains up there. It's next by the fjord. It has about 200,000 inhabitants, out of which 20,000 plus minus are students. Um, it's partly a very old city with small old houses with wooden buildings in the Norwegian style, plus a few other things around. So it, be, it has quite a mixed heritage there. It's a quite old city as well. It has been at one point centuries ago, the capital of Norway as well. Um, so this is the part where we do our work and we've shaped it a bit around this. So we work a lot with medium scale cities, uh, which is a bit different than being here in Singapore, which is a very different scale of things. It has very different needs, different requirements, different issues that need to be solved. So it's also interesting to compare this along different scales of how to deal with issues, which issues even are really at the forefront that, are, that have priority. And to wake you up a little bit, um, this is kind of how I got here from the airport. So taking a few metros and then the monorail and then walking just a tiny bit. Uh, how did you get here? And what system did you use to figure out how to get here? <laughs> Taxi, that's easy. <laughs> Google Maps, the same. Huh? Grab, I just heard about that yesterday, so like the Singapore Uber. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Did you make all your connections? <laughs> right. I made it in time. I got lost somewhere in one of the metro stations in the middle. Um, we'll get back to this later, but this is kind of a lot of the stuff I've been doing before. So finding good maps, finding the bases, finding also changes in the maps, finding options, finding spatial data, like where is the metro station? But then combining that with, well, the metro station has a timeline and it has a schedule, otherwise it doesn't help me. So in many cases, we look at a city on a map and we think we know things, but then the way we use cities quite often has a very strong temporal aspect. I need to go somewhere that is open or I need to use public transport because it comes at more or less predictable times depending on which country I am. So there is a strong temporal aspect that is sometimes just not made this explicit. So I'm going to go through a few examples here also and I wanna also have some of your experiences there. So feel free to interrupt me. This is a very open-ended talk. So if you have any questions, any suggestions, also bring them up. And very quickly, what is a smart city? Um, I don't know. There are so many definitions out there that are used by whoever wants to get something done. So we've kind of settled on something here where we 
combine a lot of things. We combine physical world, then the services in there, services from the municipality, but also everyone else that has something. Smart city doesn't mean the municipality. In some cases they orchestrate, but it's really a lot of other things that are happening as well that make a city kind of feel smart. Um, and then it's these dimensions of technology, people, institutions, organizations uh, that are around there. So it's not just one single thing. So a lot of what we do is integration also between systems, between data, between people and organizations quite a lot. So yeah, we end up with, well, this is all very dynamic and complex and social technical and it's a system of systems approach. And we try to then use that to make sense of things, uh, to build projects for urban transformations. Um, to find ways to make change happen. And one of the larger things at the moment, of course, is uh, the energy transition, climate transition, climate action, everything around that decarbonization. So a few things of um, how we see things, and this is quite strongly informed by the work with a lot of different municipalities in Europe. Um, so as I said before, it's not only driven by the municipality, it should be ideally an open ecosystem um, where different players can come in and the city is able to set some framework conditions. We've heard it before with having issues with calling Facebook, for example, because that's very much a walled garden. Um, so we have also quite a few systems in a city that are an offer there that you cannot connect to, where you don't have any insights. Um, as a city, you don't have any insights into that. So when the uh, electric scooters as a sharing option came out. Uh, first, they were kind of operating illegal, kind of like Uber does it sometimes. Uh, there was no data there and there was something quite relevant there where the municipalities wanted to have some of this data because they usually, in many cases, don't have very good mobility data of what's happening within the city. And I have some examples on that later. So finding ways to also exchange data to have as much things open as possible to see what else you can do with it, but still having separate concerns. The city doesn't want to run these things, but it wants maybe some insights, right? So then we have a lot of these changes that we're doing environmental, economical, societal. We have climate actions. We want to have more sustainable and resilient cities in the face of everything that's happening, including climate change. Um, we are trying to work towards more livable urban future, so we don't just want to we move things, we want to offer something else instead. Uh, there are topics like 15 minute city that go around a lot, uh, which basically means you develop and uh, you redevelop your city in a way that as much as possible is available on a short distance. So within 15 minutes, you have most of the urban functions you would want around you. So you don't have to take your car and drive outside to the mall that somewhere built outside the city to get your needs fulfilled there, but you have a lot of things inside. So. That's also, of course, spatial and it's a lot of planning, but it's also the temporal aspect. Like, how do I get there? How fast can I get? Um, and for example, if you have been trying to walk around here, I find that it's quite difficult to walk. I feel with a car, I might be faster and know where to go, but I got it stuck in a lot of places. So I don't know if I really managed to get around even on this small island here in 15 minutes. So. This is really a mix of different domains then. And for those cases, we work then with ourselves as kind of the facilitators, uh, with urban planners, with GIS, with any other map data we get to run analysis like these. Um, yeah, and then a lot of this also falls just under digital transformation, digitalization that happens in municipalities and companies that find different ways to offer their services. Um, and one thing here, so, well, we are all computer scientists and kind of engineers, but quite often the things that work in practice is really a combination of both the low tech and the high tech solutions. So also there, it's a lot of collaboration and negotiation of what actually makes a useful solution that can actually be deployed in reality and work. Uh, well, kind of things like the e-scooters or the iPhone, or taxis or Uber works, but there are so many other aspects where people have tried and it doesn't work because it doesn't have a good market fit. It doesn't fit the city. A lot of this, the solutions that are there don't translate that well between different types of cities. So 
what works in Trondheim might not work in Singapore and the other way around. So yeah, finding ways to integrate that. And um, because I'm in Singapore, I have to also show the slide here. So this is kind of the different scales that we look at uh, when we look at urban transitions or smart cities. So we kind of start very small, like in your own home, you have some smart home systems there. That's basically your own problem, except when the cloud goes down where it's all hosted. But then you go further to like smart buildings and then smart campus is something we would like to work on a lot because we have a bit more control than in full reality. Um, so the university campus and many other people are doing that as well is a nicer testing ground than the very wild and unfriendly full city. Um, but we're using a living lab approach in most of the projects because we need to show that something actually works out in reality. So then from there we go over with like, after we've done a lot of building integration and so on, larger type of infrastructure that works on campus or that works in a larger scale neighborhood or then up to a, to a city level. And then you have also lots of additional issues of ownership of which stakeholders are there, of who owns the infrastructure, who owns the buildings, who owns the public spaces, who owns the mobility, who owns the tram. Yeah, and then you end up maybe at one point with the smart nation, I think Singapore would be the only example at the moment uh, because it's a city state that makes it a bit easier. But this integration of trying to digitalize a whole society with basically integrating everything is quite challenging. So it's also very interesting then to be here and try to see what works, what doesn't, and how you make that work here um, with so many people on such a small space, which is very different also with how we work. But of course, we have a lot of other large cities also in Europe that do this. So uh, the large ones, Paris, London, Barcelona, Berlin, uh, have similar large scale issues where we also exchange, but we see very different needs. There are standard solutions like OpenStreetMap, Google Maps, things like that, that kind of work everywhere, but also integrating them or finding the local data is mm -hmm. quite a challenge. So going back to where do we get the bus data from? In a larger city that is more digitalized, it's usually a bit easier or Google has, or Bing as well, has a stronger incentive to get that data because there are more users. The smaller the place, also the less digitalized the transportation system might be, for example. So the place where I'm originally from, a tiny place, it still has their bus schedules on a PDF somewhere. For some reason, Bing and Google managed to extract it from there, but they don't have any APIs or anything yet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if we want to get some things done on a larger scale, uh, if we do interventions not just on the software side, but we look at integration of mobility systems, of energy systems, suddenly you have to deal with the different building owners, the different ownership structures, different legal frameworks, different contracts, which is in the end, unfortunately, a lot of my time spent on that um, because you cannot just mandate things. You have to work with uh, the different organizations to get stuff done, especially in the way we run innovation projects. Um, as long as it's not yet mandated by law or by the building code, you have to rely quite a lot on goodwill, kind of like if you want to build a project. So that's why on campus it's much easier. I have a much easier time convincing my own university or the colleagues from other departments that I can do something there with the buildings or with the, with the building automation systems. But then if I go out in the city and I want to do a nice harbor front that has five buildings with 10 different owners. But that's the real life setting where then it's not just about integration of the systems, but also the negotiation between the organizations that becomes a much stronger aspect then. And that's because you don't own all the assets. If you do something more virtual, if you just have an app, or if you, if you do mapping like OpenStreetMap or Airbnb or Uber, you don't own any of the infrastructure. Then you can do it from more from the outside. But in the other case, you need to find ways to really interact with the hardware of the city. I hope that helped a little. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, it depends. It depends. It depends on which use case I'm looking at. Um, I'm showing something afterwards where I really need it. In other cases, there is already a system in place and then the city deals with it, the utilities deal with it, and then you have one system that is there citywide. For some of the more pilot-driven inter interventions, uh, it's not quite that easy. I'll show an example afterwards. Um, first, this is a little bit of a brainstorming and I see this might be a bit small to read, but what do we do around spatial-temporal? And I collected a few things, and I hope at least Mark agrees, roughly, um, of what items are there that are already done, and what might be then new things to still look at. So the kind of very easy, obvious things is standard time-aware mm -hmm. information retrieval or recommendation systems. So. If you're looking at a map, yes, poise, but we want to know if they are there. Do they have opening hours? When is it open or is it even there? So you have uh, street food trucks that are only there part of the time. It's not even that the location is fixed of the thing that you want to go. It's not whether it's available, but whether it's even there. Um, then you have, yeah, events that are happening that are definitely time boxed uh, and you can have them once in a while, you can have them repeatedly, you can have them at one venue every Wednesday, there's this thing at the bar. You can also have moving events that go around and maybe you want to go to all of them and you rather want to know where that event is happening and not when. So it also there goes both ways. And mm -hmm. something where a lot of work has happened and I just put this here really short is um, kind of root support for poise. So a lot of work has happened there on tourist mm -hmm. recommendation system to not just give you the next poi, but to give you an itinerary. Like, I'm new to Singapore, I have one or two days, what should I go to? And then these systems can give you a selection of different things you want to go to based on your preferences, but then also based on your time. How much time do I have in general, but also when are things open or what is a good way to move between them so I optimize the time that I only have to do that. Or there are some things that I want to go to at night. So. If I want to have a view from the city, from one of the sky rise, high rises, maybe I want to see it at day, maybe I want to see it at night. There are a few things that are only open at night. There is, as I've heard, a very nice night zoo tour that you can only do at night. So also using that part in a recommendation of a tour around the city and similar for not just the tourist part, but also yourself. You, you're living here, you're working here. Like, what do you want to go to? When are things available? When are they not? Um, then the next part here also like, what about road closures, construction that's happening that's also very temporal. A lot of these are already built into the mapping systems and the routing algorithms, but it's still something that's very temporal and that we just assume it's there and we still treat it as a map. But it's quite a strong like temporal aspect as well for that. Um, yeah, then a lot of public transportation. We talked about that before. You want to make sure you get the next connection and you're not stranded because the last bus left and your system didn't tell you that because it just looked at there are buses in general. And then also what we've talked about before is mobility patterns and other user patterns across the city. How is the city being used from the side of an individual user, but also from the side of someone else that wants to do data analysis. So, looking back a bit at the keynote earlier that uh, we had in the morning, what sort of questions do we have? And what sort of questions might others have? And then also a lot of things around mobility traces um, are very interesting for a lot of different entities in the city, also for the municipality to understand better how is the city used? Where are functional centers in the city? How do we use that to change the mobility patterns or the mobility behavior, how do we understand what people's mobility needs really are to be able then to optimize the mobility, to try to decarbonize things, to see like which roads do we want to close or where do we want to have more and different options. Um, and also something that's um, quite interesting and that's a mix of data and documents is historic changes over a city. Um, quite often there's not much of a history on larger scale things. I have some example of that afterwards as well. 
and also um, volunteer geographic information that are things like crowdsourcing, crowd mapping, mm -hmm. um, which you can only do for POIS, mm -hmm. but in many cases also it has a temporal aspect like this is something I want my city to prioritize or mm -hmm. this is something that uh, is a seasonal thing that is happening that I want to put into some system or I want to make the, the municipality aware of these. And um, looking back at search, there's something that uh, I would like to see for a long time and it's not quite there yet. So it's this combination of location, time, context, other needs and transportation. So I want to find a nice bar tonight that has a view at the beach that still gets me home in time with whatever last bus or other thing is there. So. There are prototypical systems for this, but usually they don't have enough of a database uh, behind them that they work everywhere. There are some that work in specific locations, but this is something that is quite complex and it has a lot of combination of data you would need to make that happen. But these days it should be possible and actually some of the new ones like ChatGPT and others are starting to give you halfway reasonable answers for these types of queries which before have been really, really difficult to do like in a more data-based driven thing. You still need to be aware of the hallucinations, of course, so make sure that, that place is actually there that it gives you. Yeah, and then also um, the, the topic of granularity that Mark brought up before as well. So we have quite a strong granularity and data quality issue in spatial data, but we also have it then on, on temporal issues. So knowing like when something is available, uh, making sure those types of data are right. So any dependent system of that can work with it better. And there is another thing on like, how do we annotate the data? How do we uh, have better semantics? I think overall for spatial data, it's a bit better. There are better annotations and more of them um, available for temporal parts. It's not quite always there. Um, kind of everyone went first for shopping and then for some poise and then kind of ended there. So how do we also get better annotations on the data that makes it easier to extract it afterwards and to keep the semantics without having to parse it out all the time. Um, and then um, for the parts that is not really there yet so much uh, that's in different stages of being ready, um, it's a lot of urban planning and scenarios. So I want to do something with my city. What are the downstream dependencies? Do I have proper model or simulation tools that allow me to understand the short term and long term impacts, especially the second or third order effects that are very hard to model, which is getting better. Mm -hmm. We have a few projects on that, but it's quite tricky. Um, then also what are the responses of the inhabitants to these changes that are planned or actually implemented at one point. Uh, then a lot uh, these days is then on energy modeling, energy analysis, um, emission modeling, um, and digital twins, digital visualizations of cities, visualization of scenarios that need a decision. Uh, that need a lot of different disciplines to work together to understand what they all know and how we get to something that makes sense. Um, then, yeah, together with that, sustainability, uh, decarbonization, and uh, also linked with that uh, impact assessment and longer feedback loops. So I have these ideas of what I wanted to do and what I expected to come out of certain interventions. Did that actually happen? And in many cases, but I have an example on that. I explained that on that. So a few case studies. Uh, this is really a wild mix of stuff. Most of that is from myself. Otherwise, I would have annotated it. Uh, this um, looks very spatial. Uh, this is a mobility map uh, of our campus. Uh, this comes from the Wi-Fi system there that can triangulate uh, people. If you only do this for like a week or a day, uh, it's not very interesting and it's very blobby, but you can tune this down and do it on a very time-based way and step through during a day. And you can find different seasonal patterns. You see functional hotspots within the campus. Um, similar as you would see also if you do this uh, for mobile phone data then on a city. So where are functional hotspots? Where are they used at what time of day? 
um, not just for shopping or other things, also public spaces, others like that. So to better understand how the space is used, if there are some areas that are not reachable or that are underused or that are overused. So this is something that uh, is not yet used as much as we would think. There's a lot of research about it and a lot of papers written, but having this brought into urban planning and urban analysis from the city side is still not quite there yet. In most cases, this is used for very reactive real-time systems to see, oh, here's an emergency, I need to reroute traffic, things like that. But using this for longer term insights for finding different ways to do planning is not quite there yet. Then uh, here the obligatory IoT map with data coming from the sensors. I'm leaving out the heat map that's then generated out of this. Um, but this that's something that's almost standard these days in larger cities for smaller ones still it's not quite there yet. So how do you also make sense of this type of data? Um, I want to show this one because it's a really interesting, very multi-criteria thing that some colleagues of mine did a while ago. This is a hospital and they try to understand how the hospital works at the moment and then how you would plan the next generation hospital. This is a bit like the campus example I showed before. It's a very contained area and it's also a very highly functional one. So um, this has different anonymized patient data. It has the map of the different floors of the one building of the hospital, but it has many more buildings around. So uh, the different pieces of equipment have RFID tags and there are readers in different places at the hospital. In the basement, there are robots carrying all this stuff around because Norway doesn't have enough workers and people are expensive. So there are robots carrying this stuff around, but only part of it. So some of this equipment ends up being lost because no one knows where it is because the robot lost it. Um, but that's one thing. The other thing is this, which is a very nice way to look at the functional view of a patient through the hospital. They come in, they either come in, they are sent in by the doctor, or they come in through the emergency room, and then they move through different areas. This is not exactly like your standard workday, but it allows you to do the functional thing here. It does a more spatial thing. It also has a temporal aspect on this as well, like how long do you stay in each of these things? And then this can be used to optimize the hospital. So the standard things that happen when you come into the emergency room is you get a first assessment, then you probably go to the X-ray or to the CT, you have some other tests done, the lab should be too far away. So bringing then these functional areas together that you have less long ways between them or you optimize how the whole layout happens or you optimize the waiting times. And then someone realized at one point you should probably not only optimize the waiting time of the patients, but rather the ones of the doctors because there are much less of them. So making sure that the doctors have a steady stream of patients, even if it means they have to wait for a bit. And doing this, uh, it helped then building kind of the next generation hospital in a way that allowed these different things to be analyzed and to play with and to understand where really the bottlenecks are. Um, yeah, next one, this is one of my recent projects. Um, we developed this in an, in an area in the city in Trondheim. This is called Positive Energy Districts in the City Exchange Project. So here the idea is that we are doing the energy transition in a very hyper-local way. So we want the areas to produce as much uh, energy as possible locally. And this is a case where we are doing things to the buildings, which means, well, we need the goodwill and the permission of all the building owners to do that because this is still the prototype. Um, and in this case, we are integrating then the different energy that is produced by the different buildings. We are putting up renewables in the form of solar panels or geothermal or, or water heat pumps out to the fjord. And then we exchange the energy between these different buildings. Um, and to be able to exchange all that, uh, you need quite a large backend system as well that you integrate into all the different systems. And we also integrate mobility here. That means electric vehicles, which we have a lot of them in Norway these days. 
We have also electric buses, which are much larger. They have a much higher energy demand. Um, so if they just come and you don't know it's coming, it looks a bit like an overload. So we install some larger scale local batteries in the area. And then by being able to predict or by basically knowing pretty well when the buses will come, you can pre-charge your battery and then use that to not overcharge anything, to be able to charge the bus in a normal way and balance the whole system. So that's a quite strongly prediction-based system uh, that then integrates all these different functions, the different energy assets here, and has quite a strong um, temporal aspect in the end. It doesn't, in this case, for the, for the system in the back end, it doesn't even matter exactly where the things are. Much more important there is their demand over time and then the combination of the different energy assets that are there to be able to balance them out. Um, and there we have been doing something also specifically on mobility uh, because it also fits nicely with the map and the temporal part here. So being able to optimize the charging of the vehicles to take some stress away from the grid, being able to do it for larger vehicles like buses, also being able to do it for future things that are coming up, which will be electric ferries, which have a massive energy demand. Without a proper prediction models, you run into blackouts, which you don't want. Um, then on the other side, also being able to use the batteries of the electric vehicles as additional storage. So we don't need to put quite as many batteries up. So in this case here, this is a small station with a few shared electric vehicles with a small 20-foot uh, container battery and with a vehicle to grid charger. So this allows us then also to discharge um, the batteries of the electric vehicles that are there as part of the fleet. And that allows also together with a prediction model that is tying into the back end of uh, both our energy area and of the reservation system of the cars to do quite fine-grained changes of how far we want to charge up the battery, when we can discharge it, how much we can discharge it based on predicted demand or already exactly known demand. So this is a quite complex system running here that allows then the future energy systems to work and it needs quite strongly here the temporal aspect to understand when people would come in and need a car, how long they would rent out the car for so we know if we can maybe let them drive with half a battery full. So to find a way here to optimize this and overall it also reduces the amount of cars and then of parking spots and of chargers we need. So it also reduces a lot on the hardware needs here and all the associated emissions with that and the limited space we have in the city. Um, and one other thing that was then supported through this uh, is, well, th the app, because there's always one. Um, this is an integrated mobility solution of all the options you have then in the city of Trondheim. It has the electric vehicles from our project. It has other car sharing cars by now from three other companies uh, that uh, then wanted to become part of this. It has electric scooters that operate in the city. Uh, it has the ferries, it has trains, airplanes, and it also has the buses. And here, uh, we don't just have the bus stops or the major bus station. We also have the live positions of the buses. Because since around two years ago, we have a national uh, database uh, of moving objects of all the buses in the whole country, which allows you to do quite nice prediction here. So. What is happening now is that we have screens on the bus stops, which tell you when the next bus comes. It's a rough prediction. Um, people start using the app because that's more exact and you see where the bus actually is because the other predictions are wrong. So now this actually, uh, the, the national database there has one of the first use cases then with finding a way to integrate it to not only show the buses, but to show other options here as well. So that's kind of one thing that makes it very integrated and smart. We're trying to have in the next phase also this thing um, able to uh, to enable you to buy an integrated ticket for your travel. So you take an electric scooter or one of the shared bikes to the bus station, you take the bus to the ferry stop, you take it from there. At the moment, we're not allowed to for some national regulation, but we hope that will 
go away rather soon and then you could also buy your more integrated ticket. But at the moment, at least it allows you this and it had this unintentional side effect that in the end, a lot of people were using this because it didn't, didn't trust the systems on the bus stops themselves. <laughs> Right, um, then uh, going to kind of the digital twins, uh, which is basically a fancy 3D city model with a lot of different functionalities and systems plugged in. Um, this is for the city of Trondheim, slightly different angle. Uh, this is one of the energy modeling approaches here to understand which, which of the buildings and the different other assets here have different energy demands. Um, where do we start retrofitting buildings? Where does it make most sense? How do we prioritize? Also there with not just the raw energy demand over the year, which is plotted here, but then also understanding where the peaks are, how big they are, if we, while we do something with the buildings, also can we use uh, the peaks in the grid, uh, merge it with the other uh, ideas I showed before with uh, batteries that need to be put up to also optimize their location in the grid, but also then understand the, the energy demand over the year uh, to have a bit more fine-grained analysis because just the annual averages don't really help you if you try to do something smart on the grid. Um, and we're using this for different ways and we can plug in different models into it. Uh, so this is uh, another city in the project. This is in Limerick. So they have a similar model, they're on a big screen, but they also have a physical model, uh, which allows you then to do very hands-on exercises with, uh, with the citizens or with, with school kids to play around with that and to look at both things at once. Um, we have also something in Trondheim, which is pretty nice, which is similar like this uh, 3D model, uh, 3D printed then with a projector on top uh, that is a bit interactive. Unfortunately, the company couldn't yet get it to work, so I don't have a good picture of that. <laughs> but also to find ways to interact with that and to show then predictions of what different planned developments in the cities, uh, new high rises, uh, new districts, uh, closure or removal of roads or added roads, or added bridges would look like. And on that note, um, in another project, um, we are working with a company called Augment City that is in Ålesund, another city in Norway. Uh, they have a very nice digital model uh, that also can plug in different prediction models. And this whole thing is in a cave, so it's a huge, so it's a huge ball of, I don't know, 15, 10, 15 meters diameter where you can then fly through the city. It's very impressive. But also you can plug in different systems for prediction. So uh, you see here um, something about water. Uh, you see mobility simulation, uh, something on citizen engagement. So how happy people are or how much they have been involved or feel they are, uh, how close they are to spaces, um, their mobility patterns over time. Also then uh, energy simulation, similar like I showed before. Uh, to also find out which parts of the city to prioritize. And then also here going back to this one, a mobility analysis, which also then shows you the either aggregated traffic or the broken down traffic individually over a day under different assumptions of how you would build your developments in the city. Uh, they are, in this case, they are moving one of the major bus stops um, which is you can't just do because you will get a complete mess. So there are a lot of these prediction models uh, turned out to be not quite as great yet, and they need to be integrated with the other ones. Um, so this is an ongoing work here, but also there are quite strongly integration of different prediction models into something that gives you a broader view that helps you not do just one thing, but look at the side effects, look at the second order effects. Um, yeah, this is the very data-driven side and the visualization side. Um, I want to come back a little bit to this. Um, and this is the other side of the decision support. This is how a city is actually run. There are a lot of strategy documents. Um, in this case, this is the climate plan of Trondheim over quite a few years. Um, and quite often what happens is you plan something and then you do it. And then at one point you do the next plan and the next plan and the next plan. 
and you never quite look back. So you have your project and you do like your little iteration within that project and you learn something from that, but you never quite go back and check, did your assumptions hold? Are your assumptions still valid? Should you change something in your model of how you think about that, how you run your next planning cycle, how you run your next projects? So having these larger feedback learning loops to understand why we did things or why we thought it was a good idea 10 years ago. And then also being able to follow up on, okay, this worked because of that, or it just worked because we were lucky, or it failed because we were unlucky, or it failed because it's really a bad idea. This is something that's extremely underdeveloped in urban planning, in mobility planning, and other things that cities do. So finding ways to bring this back and to also find all documents to be able to extract then, okay, what did this old document say about the future? What was the plan? Is there an intention of why this was done? And if you look very closely, you also see that some things are missing. There's one from 2001, then there's the 2017 to 2030, and the 2024 to 30. There's, there are a few missing in there. I couldn't find them on short notice. They must be somewhere, but this is the same thing that someone working in the municipality or in the planning departments also sees. Like, I'm new here, I don't know where your documents are. I don't know what your plans were, I'm just iterating on the project you gave me. So being able to go back and understand the assumptions is quite relevant. And well, some of this also goes back. Uh, for many of us, it's easy. We just look at old GitHub and don't understand our comments that were given there. Here it's on a much larger scale, but it's kind of a similar thing. You don't quite understand why things were done like that or even if some of the earlier projects reached their goals and if we should do that again or do more of it or not. And this is quite a strong feedback loop that's really not there yet. And it's one of the larger challenges as well because everyone does small interventions and is never quite able to say, did I even reach my goals? And this is then a combination of the documents of any evidence I have as data, like yearly emission inventories, yearly mobility numbers, anything else like that. So finding ways to do that. If, you're, if you can do that, uh, talk to me. <laughs> but also you can get a lot of good papers and probably a very good consultancy gigs out of that. Right, I'm jumping over the next ones here, um, just to come to an end here. Um, so these, you probably all have seen these. This is a lot of what informs our daily work. So that's uh, only going up to 2020. That's the overall atmospheric CO2. So clearly we are in a crisis mode, but we don't quite act like it yet. So this is something that these days is one of the main issues, uh, at least on municipality level, not everywhere else yet. So this is also quite strongly anything we can do on climate action is something that gets prioritized, which is also where we are working on and which also is kind of was underlying a lot of the things I discussed now. Um, yeah, quick summary. So the whole smart city topic is very disjoint. It's not one thing you do, it's a whole bag of interesting things. So it's ch it has quite challenging information access and retrieval scenarios really interesting ones as well. It's quite interesting and uh, when things work, very validating to get stuff working there. And it's really a complex process with a lot of different moving parts, different organizations and people involved. And yeah, also to change a bit this view, what I said before, so cities are mostly place based and we think they're full of spatial data, but the way we use them is much more temporal and that aspect also quite often doesn't quite fit in there. And it also doesn't always yet fit into the analysis we do to understand what is happening. So also spatial temporal analysis can be used really as a process support for a lot of interesting things that are happening kind of behind the scenes, but it's not just the whole bureaucracy of the city, it's really interesting things that are happening on the municipal level where lots of people are trying to make sense of this. Yeah. Um, with this, I'm almost at the end. I want to show something here for the discussion to get that started. Um, this is something I found the other day. Um, this someone went in and made some isochrones for Singapore. So that's basically uh, your travel time from a point here. So we have 
point here in the middle. I just put this here right at our conference place, more or less. Uh, so this is like, I think it's, it should be 10, 15, 30 minutes, how far you reach. So this is also a very interesting thing to understand your city, like how far can you move around? What options do you have? And if you move this thing around, uh, to, to put it back, back here into more the city center, the banking area, you see that suddenly you have much more options because you have much more public transport, other options, um, and your radius of movement gets bigger. And one interesting thing also here is you think of the isochrones as, yes, this is kind of an onion. But it's not quite because you have these longer scale uh, metro lines, for example. So you get these little blobs around the metro stations. Also down here and then up here. So you start to get these disjoint islands of reachability. And this is very much a mix of the temporal analysis, but also understanding the underlying uh, mobility system which is not exactly the road system, because in this case, you'll just pop up here because you can't get off the train. If you ride your bike, it's different. Um, but also you see a few things here where along the main roads, you can get a bit further than in other places. Uh, this is also like rough. This needs a lot of computational power. This is a kind of quick and dirty solution. Uh, you see that here, like it's a bit weird because it doesn't know, for example, that you cannot just walk into the park, things like that. Um, and that some places here are kind of closed off. If you try to walk down from the beach up to here, like this is not the exact shape, but it's a, it's a good initial indication. And if you want to have this more details, you actually run that route. But being able to do these things, to use that also for understanding how the city presents itself or how you can experience a city is then a very different way of, of dealing with that. And finding out what sort of analysis on a very simple level already help you to get suddenly a very different understanding. And this is also something very nice, just if you're in, in a new place, try to find a system like that uh, for that city um, to understand like what's your radius, what places should you go to that you didn't even know yet were there. So also like explore the city a bit. With that, I'm almost done, uh, but I wanna bring up a few questions to you because I've been talking now a bit too much. So, does this resonate? What are the scenarios? Do you see what's missing? What do you think you're already working on and it's not quite working or it's already there and no one here in the room knows it? Well, I have an inspiration for you, but I mean, I'll take it or, or leave it, but uh, you showed the aspects of uh, time and space, very nice uh, tentacles, by the way, so this uh, <laughs> map, so my, was, uh, my station was Bentemir. Uh, which is uh, one of the first blobs. No, but seriously speaking, I mean, one thing which you might uh, consider as well is uh, also concerning time. So the age range of of users. So I mean, uh, checking if they are, let's say, areas for kids. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Or also, uh, if you think of it, there's also gender related things. So uh, a football match, uh, I would assume, would attract more me uh, male uh, people than females, whereas a Zumba course uh, is on the uh, is on the counter uh, on the uh, on the other side. Uh, so this would be. I know it's not so easy to mine this kind of data, and potentially politically not so easy to motivate. But still, uh, I see some use cases for it. Yeah, there's also something else where. Um we are working also on inclusivity in our projects, not just the usual gender and things like that, but really in how you use the place. And then yes, age plays a role, uh, gender also in terms of perceived say, or actual safety of areas, but also the part of, well, if a wheelchair user can go somewhere, it also means like someone with a baby in a stroller can go or like, as business travelers with too much suitcases can also go there. Or like the pedestrian ways around here would maybe be a bit differently so I can cross someone that comes across me. So these different things also are interesting aspects. Uh, some of that I have colleagues that are working then on some GIS models to model accessibility or walkability of areas, but you need extremely high granularity data for that. It's not so much a temporal issue, but you have this, uh, or oh, it's really difficult to then do that. But for example, there are a few places, like there are some parks 
where it's totally fine to be on the day, but you don't want to be there at night. How do you model that? Where do you even get the data for that? Yeah, but then it's temporary. Yeah, then it, then it is, yeah. But the other part is is not. So that's then also in some cases this, yeah. like the, con the temporal context would be really interesting, but it's much harder to get because it's even much more subjective. But yeah, you can try to, f there are some projects that are also trying to map that out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think uh, my, my comment or question is probably related uh, to, to, to the previous discussion. So I wonder how uh, unstructured user data, for example, could also be a firm, say, uh, like travel blogs, for example, might sometimes outline that there are some areas you shouldn't visit at night, right? And if you could somehow run some information extraction system or so on that and to automatically obtain this data beyond pure sensory data, right? This could be helpful and could augment also the data quite well in many situations. Also, maybe, for example, some travel blog might outline that. And this could be interesting for children or for elderly people. So you can do some of that also in OpenStreetMap, but very few contributors go in there because it has quite a steep learning curve to find those extra features. But yeah, originally a lot of the geospatial retrieval and temporal retrieval started from documents. So, well, some of the travel blocks these days uh, look very auto-generated, but yeah, there are also some interesting things there in terms of itineraries and things like that. Um, some of them seem to copy from each other, but others definitely have something that's valuable. So finding also that out. Yeah, to basically also be able to understand the city a bit differently and to maybe be a bit surprised. But I was wondering if you are maybe familiar with um, Vienna case study, um, especially for the app that you presented. Obviously, it's not so high dimensional, uh, I guess, as you were planning to, but uh, Vien Mobile is like the app for um, combining different modes of transportation, so bike, uh, U-Bahn, which is a metro, and yeah. a tram, and so on. And it works quite seamlessly. So you Additionally, the real time when the tram is coming or if it's late and due to uh, what caused uh, uh, the overlay. And uh, yeah, so just maybe if probably if you're familiar with it, I'm not sure, but it's I think a quite nice use case scenario for implementation of different modes of transportation mm. in the city. Um, yeah, no, that's it's actually a nice case, and a lot of other cities are doing this as well. But everyone is doing it for themselves. There are very few like white box solutions that would work elsewhere. Also because in many cases, the data is not really there. And Vienna, as far as I know, they have the data because they own the transport authority. <laughs> so then it makes it a bit easier, but they wouldn't make all of that necessarily public. So we have also a bit of a special case here in Norway where at one point it was mandated that the actual real time location of the buses needs to be put in the system together with the schedules and the bus stops and everything else. So then it allows much more other people to play with this, build something on top of it. So then it's, well, we pu maybe pushed a bit uh, because also then the city of Trondheim was extremely annoyed when the data that was promised, which we also relied on in the project, wasn't there yet because the system was delayed. And then it was, yes, we have other priorities and well, we have to do it, but we don't really see why. And then also some of the cities pushed like, but we have an idea what we want to do with it. So that's also kind of this organizational part that you don't always get what you want, but you have a little bit of pull, especially then if you are one of the large, well, Trondheim is the third largest city in the country, but again, it's really small. <laughs> yeah, but everyone, everyone has something like this. It's where everything is going, but the integration works in very different ways in different cities. It would be nice to have this actually as an integrated thing and as a more open part as well, so more people could contribute instead of everyone building their own little thing, because that slows down the overall development, of course. Yeah, And also the feedback then to the data, which is quite useful once you can actually, once you have open data like this, 
uh, and you use it, then you realize if it's really fit for use or if there's something else you need. And, and regarding the planning side, so with the some legislations that you pointed out, actually how long does it take after a certain feedback to implement it later? Because I saw some different time ranges. At the beginning it was just 2001, you mentioned that there are some missing documents, and then one uh, mm. book was from 2017 till 2030. It's a, a, like um, long for forecast, and then the last one was just for six years. So you see this tendency of decreasing the time frame. From no, it's kind of different plans. They are they are moving. They are not always exactly the same plan. At one point there was just a climate plan. Now we have a climate plan, a mobility plan, a societal master plan, an area development plan. Looks yeah. different in each of the cities. They should be compatible. Some of them were not. Now that also more work is being done to actually analyze the documents against each other to make sure they are at least consistent. Otherwise, you cannot even implement it because your own regulations contradict each other. And this is also because there is the 2030 goal for a lot of the decarbonization that's supposed to happen, which is unlikely to fully happen. But that also means everyone has to accelerate this and then more effort gets put into that now. So it's a bit late, but at least it's happening now. But that means you have to do the process behind it differently. Um, there is a stronger push now also to do this more data driven than only collecting a bunch of urban development projects. But you for everything now, you have to do things. There is, for example, for Trondheim, there is a climate budget, which is part of the normal budgeting process, more or less. So you have to, for a new project, also show that you're not going or that you're reducing the, the emissions for the city as well. So changing the way that the municipalities do business with their own projects and with others that they're running as well. That's quite critical and that needs a lot of the analysis across the documents and also then the understanding of, well, what's already there, what is planned, what is happening in parallel and how do we get the data from ongoing projects um, from historic projects that we can learn from, like we maybe do the same thing now again, or we need to do it differently because it didn't work out. But this that's a lot of legwork and a lot of desk research that takes a lot of time. So supporting that in a way will also hopefully help to do the planning then better. Seems like you basically had your Q&A session already integrated. So I think uh, if there are no additional questions that are upcoming from your side or comments, then we can conclude. Yeah. Then I was just to say quickly thank you to some of my team that's here and the different projects that we are running at the moment and otherwise ask me questions here.